Father, thank you for uh, giving us the great privilege of looking at this uh, greatest book of all time, bestseller of all time, a uh, book that has changed uh, lives and given hope, uh, revealed your promises, revealed your character. I pray as we wrestle with the meaning of the text that you help us today, help us ask good questions, and I pray in all of it that our minds will be drawn to Christ and the redemption that he has purchased for us. I pray that you would cause us uh, to have a little uh, of the joy of finding the kingdom like a treasure hidden in a field, and just out of joy we would go and give everything we had just to have that treasure. Would you give us a little bit a uh, little glimpse of that today as we look at this text. And we pray all of it in Christ's name. Amen. So I want to read chapter 3 uh, as we start, as we do every day. But there are a couple of things I want to point out. And so uh, I'm just going to point them out. And the things you find interesting, you ask about when, as soon as we finish. Now, you know that in the original text, there were no chapter breaks or verse numbers. Those were added. Uh, those were added in the Middle Ages so that we could find. They weren't written um, as part of the original, and sometimes they get in the way. I think they may get in the way here. So I'm going to go and reread uh, part of chapter 2 as we look at this. Therefore, a man will abandon his father and his mother and will stick to his wife. It's really the word glue. will be glued to his wife. And the two of them will become one flesh. And the two of them were naked. And um, this is the word naked in Hebrew, arumim, the im part on the end is how you make it a plural. So the word naked is the word arum. The two of them were arum, that is the man and his woman, and they were not shaming themselves, or they, they felt no shame, or uh, something like that. In 3.1, now the serpent was the most a room of any other creature of the field that God had made. And I want you to see that in this case, the word naked and the word crafty are the exact same word in Hebrew. In fact, to get that connection the word naked, when applied to man and woman, is slightly misspelled in relation to the other uses of naked in the text. So when uh, man and woman are driven out of Eden, they are uh, ahrim. Can you hear that? That isn't ahrim. Um, so here they're ahrim, and the serpent is the most ahrim of all. God's creatures. Uh, in an unpointed text, those words are exactly the same word. Um, in Proverbs, there's even a play um, on the word crafty and its connection with the word naked because it says the crafty man covers wisdom. And somehow that's a play on words where crafty and naked are somehow connected. And so it's kind of a Pun, but that's how we know that somehow this craftiness of the serpent and nakedness for the man and his wife, they're connected somehow in the story. So the Nahash, the serpent, uh, was the most a room of all the creatures of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said, that is, the serpent did, to the woman, did Elohim really say that 
y'all can't eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the Nahash, from the tree, uh, from the fruit of the tree of the garden, we will eat or we must eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, Elohim said, y'all shall not eat from it, will not eat from it. Y'all shall not touch it lest y'all die. Now, I realize that's Southern, but that's the only way I know to get the fact that they're saying these in the plural. If we went and back and read it in the Hebrew, God never said any of this. He didn't say, y'all shall not eat. He said to Adam, you individual man shall not eat. The command was given to the man. Uh, the command was not given to the man and the woman. Maybe it's true by inference, but the, the command was given to the man. When she repeats it, and when the Nahash repeats it, they uh, make it to everybody, um, but the command was given to one person, to, to Ha'adam. And did you notice that the woman adds a command that isn't there? She says, you will not, y'all shall not touch it. God never said anything about them not touching the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, as far as the text uh, says, they could touch it all day long if they wanted to. God said, do not eat it. And if that's true, this is the first example of legalism in the Bible. That is, God gives you a command. And then to try to keep that command, you add another command that God didn't give you. And somehow that makes you more holy. Eve is doing that here. She adds, or maybe Adam had added it before. We don't know in the story. But somebody gives a command that God didn't give them in the original text. From the tree, uh, from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, Elohim said, you all will not eat from it, and you all will not touch it, lest you all die. That's not what God said. God said to Adam, individually, if you eat it, you will die. The Nahash said to the woman, you all surely will not die because Elohim, he singular, Elohim knows that in the day you all eat from it, you all's eyes will be open and you all will become like Elohim, Elohim plural, plural knowing good and evil. And I'm not sure how to take this in Hebrew. I'm not sure if the Satan is uh, saying they'll be individually Elohim knowing, or I don't know if the Satan is saying that Elohim isn't really a singular thing after all. It's a plural thing. and I, So I don't know if it's the first attempt at polytheism or not, but the, the participle here, knowing, is plural. And this verb, know, is singular. So something weird going on in the text. Then the woman saw that the tree key tove, that it was good. If we were reading the whole thing in Hebrew, uh, we would see that when God creates, he sees Vayara Elohim Kitov. And God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was Tov Me'od, very good. When it comes to Adam being alone, God sees that it was not good. Lo, lo uh, Tov, 
But here, Eve is doing something that had been reserved for God. God was the one who decides what's good and what's not. Now it's Eve deciding what's good and what's not. So uh, uh, the woman saw that the tree Keto, that it was good for food and that it was desirous to the eyes uh, and that the tree was delightful to make one wise. If you've ever read in the Psalms and you've seen that term mashkel, this is a mashkel, this is something that makes someone wise. Well, here's the first uh, use of that, that it could make her wise. And she took from its fruit and she ate and she gave also to her man who was with her. Often when we uh, picture this story in our minds, we picture Eve alone, but the text won't let us think of Eve alone. Adam is right there and he's not saying a word. She's doing this. She eats it. She doesn't die. He takes it and he uh, eats it. And the eyes of the two of them were opened. That's exactly what Satan said would happen. You eat this, your eyes will be opened. The problem is uh, they never see God ever again. Their eyes are open, but it's open to a different reality, and God's reality is somehow invisible. Their eyes, the eyes of the two of them were open, and they knew that they were ah, ah, rumin. Now remember, ahrum was the word. Now it's spelled different, ah, rumin. They, they knew they were exile naked. This is the nakedness when Somebody comes and steals everything you've got and takes you into captivity. Different from the nakedness in the end of two. Different from the nakedness of the serpent. But they knew that they were exiled naked. They knew that they were homeless naked. Uh, they knew that they were penniless naked. Something like that. And they hit... Uh, Sorry, they sowed for themselves a uh, uh, fig leaf and they made for themselves garments to uh, cover up their genitalia. So this isn't like a garment to cover up everything. This is just loincloth garments. And you have to ask yourself, why in the world are they covering up their genitalia at this point. And they heard, notice it's not saw, they heard the voice of Yahweh Elohim walking around in the garden in the ruach of the day, in the spirit of the day, in the afternoon when the wind starts to blow. You have to ask yourself, did anything else happened in the late afternoon in the story of the Bible. And Ha-Adam hid himself and his wife hid herself from before Yahweh Elohim and they hid themselves in the midst of the tree of the garden. Now I don't quite get that. They're covering themselves with leaves and then they're using the tree to try to camouflage themselves. I, I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. It seems a little weird to me. And Yahweh Elohim called to Ha'adam. Notice it doesn't say he called to Ha'adam and his wife. God called to Ha'adam and he said to him, notice that at this point he's not talking to both of them. He's talking to the Ha'adam. Where are you? You singular, you man. And the man said uh, to him, Your voice uh, I heard in the garden, and I was afraid because I saw that I was poverty stricken naked. 
and I was hidden. Notice he doesn't say, I hid myself. He says, I was hidden. I, I was just standing there and, you know, like I, I was hidden. It's almost like that flat out lie that Aaron says, we threw this gold in the fire and out came this calf. And you want to say, you big fat liar, you fashioned that thing. You, and we see it, that, that uh, propensity to deceive, that propensity to blame shift. I, I was hidden. And uh, God says, who told you that you were poverty stricken naked? Is it not that the tree which I commanded you, singular, you man, not to eat from it, is it not that you, you singular man, have eaten from it? And Ha Adam said, The woman, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave to me from the tree, and, and I ate. And Yahweh said to the woman, what's this you've done? And she, and the woman said, the Nahash, the Nahash uh, uh, beguiled me, the Nahash tempted me, and, and I ate. And Yahweh Elohim said to the Nahash, because you did this thing, a ruler, cursed are you, singular, more than all the beasts, uh, more than all the living creatures of the field, on your belly, and belly and pride are similar words in uh, Hebrew, uh, you will walk, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And recall uh, that dust is what man is made out of. So the serpent is going to eat the raw material that man is made out of. Uh, enmity. Now this word enmity is really weird. Um, it's the same um, spelling as Job's name. You know the book of Job? Uh, Job's name means enmity. It's like, okay, how... Why, why is he called enmity? Who's hating him? Enmity, I will put between you, singular, and between the woman, between you, singular's seed, and between her seed. He will something your head, smash your head to pieces maybe, and whatever that smash word is here, it's the same word here. Um, and you will smash his heel. Now let me just ask something. Who else is connected with heel in the story? Is there anybody whose name is like heel in the story? Jacob? So this word is very, very close to the word Jacob in the text. To the woman, he said, I will surely greatly increase your pain and I will certainly increase your childbearing. Now, I don't know what to make of that. Does that imply that there was pain in childbearing before this happened? Does that imply there was childbearing before this happened? And what does it mean when it says, I will greatly increase your conceiving? Does that mean the process will be harder? I don't know, but that's that's what uh, God uh, is doing in horrible pain you will bear sons and to your man will be your desire now i can tell you uh men are going to say oh that's a great thing uh the woman's desire will be for the man 
that's not what this means. This is the same desire when it says sin is crouching at your door and it desires to eat you alive. This is not positive desire. This is, uh, I'm going to make the man's life miserable. I'm going to take the man's place desire. At least that's how, if, if that's how you read desire in um, uh, the later chapters, it's exact. It's the exact same word here. Uh, your desire will be for your man, and he will govern over you. Notice until this point, the man and his wife together would be emperor and empress of the universe. Now, the woman, instead of sharing the man's rule, will be ruled over, uh, just like he rules over uh, the animals. <coughs> to the Adam, he said, uh, because you listen to the voice of your woman, uh, you singular, and because you listen to the voice of your woman, and you ate from the tree which I commanded you, singular man, not to eat fr from it. Cursed is the ground instead of you, or cursed is the ground for your sake. In horrible sweat, um, you will uh, eat from it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, uh, it will uh, sprout for you singular. And uh, you, you will eat the herbs of the field. In, oh, sorry, I got this one wrong. In horrible pain. And this is in horrible sweat, you will eat uh, bread until you, singular, return to the Adamah from which you were taken because you, man, are dust and to dust you, man, will return. And the Adam called the name of his woman Hava, which in Hebrew means life because she became the mother of everything living. And Yahweh Elohim made for not the Adam, but just Adam. God, uh, Yahweh Elohim made for Adam and for his woman robes. Um, um, uh, wrist length robe. So this is a, they made uh, something to cover their genitalia. God made a royal robe uh, for them. Garments of skin. So God killed an animal to do this. And he clothed the two of them. And Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the Adam has become like one from us to know good and evil. And now, lest he, singular, uh, send forth his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever, uh, behold, Yahweh Elohim uh, sent them out of the garden of pleasure to laboriously work the Adamah which he was taken from it. And he, he uh, drove out the Ha'adam. And Ha'adam dwelled in the east to Eden. And the cherubs and the flaming sword, uh, turning every direction, he put to guard the way to the tree of life. So, may God bless the reading of his word uh, this afternoon. So, what do you find interesting? That's Genesis 3. I read it as literally as I could uh, in Hebrew. What do you find interesting about Genesis 3? Yes, tell me your name. Jared. 
Sorry. Right, the serpent can talk. Um, the text points to one other animal who talked, that is Balaam's donkey. Um, the text will talk about the hills crying out and the trees clapping their hands. But this is weird. Um, the serpent, the Nahash, uh, talks. Elsewhere in the Bible, the Nahash is identified in Revelation as the ancient uh, Satan is identified with the ancient serpent. Um, I don't know how to take that. If like the animal could normally talk or if Satan is somehow speaking and is inside the animal. I know that the demons uh, in the Gadarene demoniac possess one man and then they uh, possess 2,000 pigs and make them run into the... So I don't know if there's something like that going on here, but it's weird. It's weird in the story. What else do you find interesting? Uh, yes, tell me your name. Joey. I find it interesting that probably says the man has become like us. Like a, that's that whole Elohim singular plural um, and we we hit it all kinds of places, but it really jumps out here. Man has become like one of us, which is odd. It's kind of what Satan said would happen, but not really. Um, they, in one way, they become like God, but in another way, they become horribly evil in the process. What else do you find interesting in the story? Yes, tell me your name. Holly. I mean, you think about it. God had given them a pretty good gig. They're going to live forever. They're never going to be sick. Their main command is to... Experience intimacy with one another until they fill the whole world with children. God calls it the garden of pleasure. And that wasn't enough for them. They had to break the one rule that God had given them. That seems pretty unreasonable to me. Um, and we as readers are faced with the question, why in the world would anybody in their right mind do that? Why would they break the one commandment that the God who had given them the garden and each other and food and forever, why in the world would they reject the rule of God? And do you, do you have an idea, Holly, or anyone have an idea? Like, that seems stupid to me. I mean, God has given, I mean, what else could God have given? You know, they had infinite resources. They had, they could do anything they wanted. Um, they were going to live forever. They had each other. They had unbelievable sexual pleasure. And, hi. Um, I'm just going to check and see if my book is in here. Okay. <laughs> uh, and yet, somehow, they wanted to do the one thing that God said don't do. And the only thing I can conclude is our two forefathers, our parents, were two of the stupidest people who ever walked the planet Earth. That is stupid. Like, there's, there's dumb and there's dumb and there's like stupid and there's like this is stupid and they do it anyway and they're our parents we want to honor our parents father and mother but you're going to tell the truth they're stupid they're they're like beyond stupid but then i suppose 
God would say to us, well, do you disobey what I say to you? Have I been good to you? And do you come to the things that I say and say, well, God said don't do this. And, you know, who does he think he is? God or something? Well, yeah, he thinks he's God because he is God. What does he think? Like he created the world? Yeah, he created. Did he create you? Does, does he cause electricity to run your body? Did he give you a brain? Does he give the air that goes? Does he give you food? The idea of rejecting the rule of God because it might be better if we reject it, that is a fundamental family flaw stupidity that runs through all of us. Now we might say, why didn't God do it differently? God may say to us, next time there's a universe to be created, just jump right in there. You think you can do a better job? Uh, you know, just speak it into existence, just hold it together, just, you know. Or maybe we say, since God created the world, maybe he knows more. I wonder, we say, well, why didn't God do it differently? Why didn't God create a woman untemptable by evil? And I think God's saying, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm creating a world where people will not be forced to do what's right, but will want to do what's right. And when that wanting to do what's right happens, we're going to be exactly back where we were. Two people in the garden, infinite possibilities, uh, infinite um, development, infinite pleasure. God, is, in the story of the Bible, God is creating uh, a woman untemptable by evil, a woman who will be the empress of the universe, who together with her husband will be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all the creeps that creep on the ground. The woman at that point will not be mashalled by the man. She's going to be in love with the man. She's going to want to do what her husband uh, wants her to do, but he's not going to rule over her. She's going to be the queen of the universe at that point. The story of the Bible is how that woman is created. Um, what else do you find interesting about this story? What do you find confusing about this story? Um, to me, just in this chapter and also um, in the previous chapter too, in both the like the first third and the last verse, um, every time it talks about the tree of life, it's actually the tree of knowledge. And then when God breathes life into um, Adam and Eve, then like the lives continue. What do you make of that, uh, Emily? Yeah, God, God's saying you can't imagine. And so it is. And I don't know that I'd ever seen that, but it, it is like Nefesh Hayah, the soul of life singular. But these are plural, uh, and they're plural for a reason. Uh, maybe it's living on multiple, like, like you said. That's good. What else? What else do you find interesting? Holly? What do you make of that? So, Holly, you're there. You're Adam. Like, what would you do? 
So that God had given Adam the command to guard and keep the garden. And he's standing there, not saying a word. Help me. What, what should Adam have done? Let's brainstorm. Like, Adam doesn't fall. What should he do? What would you do if somebody was about to seduce your wife into something that would mean that you lose everything, you lose immortality, you lose billions and billions, trillions of dollars, um, you lose everything? What would you? What would be a good thing to do if you were Adam? I think I would start talking to the snake and say, you know, that really makes a lot of sense. And I would be reaching for a rock or a stick or something else. And I'm going to bash that snake's brains in. I'm going to stop striking the snake when the snake is dead. I mean, I'm a nice guy, but somebody is trying to rob my fr family, hurt my family. I tell you what, I'm going to die or I'm going to kill him. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And Adam doesn't. So what do you make of that? Why in the world would Adam not do that? That could be it. It's not the answer that Paul gives. Do you know what Paul Paul's answer is to this? Well, his partial answer. This is what Paul says about Eve in this event. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Now help me with that. He purposely chose, and it says he wasn't deceived. He knew they were going to get kicked out of the garden. So, is there something that normally trips up men in the Bible where they choose not to follow God but to follow something else? Is there a character flaw in male humanity in the Bible where they reject the ways of God in favor of something else. And if so, what is that thing? Who's the strongest guy in the Bible? Strongest guy in the Bible, who is it? Samson. What trips him up? A beautiful woman. Okay, who's the smartest guy in the Bible? Solomon. So God says, uh, don't multiply wives, don't multiply horses, uh, don't multiply chariots, uh, don't multiply money. He makes money so much that he devalues silver. He has a thousand women. He's married to, I think, 300. He has 700 mistresses. I don't know about you, but I think the guy's got a problem. I think they have groups for that. God says don't do it, but what succeeded in turning the wisest man's heart away from worship of God in favor of something else? What was it? Beautiful women. Um, the best psalm writer in the Bible is who? 
David and what tripped him up. Okay, uh, Balaam tries to curse Israel, can't, and finally he comes up and says, look, I can't curse, but if you want to get these people messed up with God, go find the most beautiful women, pagan women you can, and uh, have them lure the men away, and those beautiful women will turn their hearts away from God, and then you can get what you want because they won't be following God. Now, all that sounds like it's against women, doesn't it? But the final story, is there one man who marries one really beautiful woman and they have like this Song of Solomon relationship? Is there one woman like that in the Bible? There is, isn't it? The church. And the man is Jesus. So it isn't the beauty it's somehow the pagan beauty that's wrong. So you're there with Adam, and remind me, is Eve naked at that point? And she eats. So you've got a choice, okay? You're Adam. Why in the world would you, knowing you're going to get kicked out of the Garden of Eden, why would you do it? It says he wasn't deceived. Why would you do it? What's he choosing over God? Isn't he choosing a beautiful naked woman over God? Isn't he saying, God, I know this isn't going to work out, but if I've got to choose between her and you, um, I choose her. And how long does that... Uh, last in terms of because that sounds quite romantic doesn't it? it sounds like you know edward giving up the throne of england for wallace uh, simpson uh, wallace is a girl's name right you know but uh, that sounds very romantic right how long does it play out like that it plays out about five minutes right because what's he saying when god calls him on the carpet What's the first thing out of his mouth? That what he doesn't even call her by name. That woman. And notice when did you pick up when I read it that when he hid, he only hid himself. He didn't hide her. Adam wasn't choosing her, he was choosing Seth. And as long as she would give him that, he was fine with her, but he cared nothing for her as a person. And isn't that the way human sexuality started to work out in Genesis? With Lamech, he's the one who marries two wives. If one wife's good, two better, David comes along, what does he have, like 26? And then his son has a 1,000. I don't even think you could remember a thousand people's names. This is the spiritual depravity of someone choosing uh, human sexuality over God. And it's disastrous in how it plays out. Now, he did that at least that's how I'm reading this story. Maybe there's a different way to read it. You decide for yourself. I'm trying to put the pieces together. I think Paul saying that Adam wasn't deceived forces us to ask why in the world would he do it if he knew they were going to get kicked out. And it seems like the answer in the Bible, four fallen men is beautiful pagan women. He's choosing. Jesus chose God over his wife. And the result of that is Jesus gets the Song of Solomon relationship. Jesus does the fundamental opposite of what Adam did. He puts nothing ahead of God. 
I wonder if that isn't beginning to give us a glimpse in how the kingdom of God works. Because the devil is going to try to recycle the same old lie. He's going to tell you, if you want to have pleasure in life, just break God's rules. Break God's rules. I know God said do this, but don't listen to what God said. Just do it this way. Let me tell you, God will. God is about bringing good to you as a person, ultimate good. But he's not going to do that if you don't do it God's way. Um, our culture has bought into a lie of sexual promiscuity. And the lie says this, if you want happiness, just throw God's morality out the window and you'll just be blissfully happy. And it's a lie. It's an absolute lie. Um, What is it? 50% of all marriages in uh, America end in divorce. Um, All those uh, people started out there in just enraptured with each other and something happens and half the people out there uh, end in divorce. Versus God who says, there's something I want to teach you about human sexuality and it's going to involve you waiting until you marry. Uh, but God says, trust me, if you wait till you marry, um, you'll learn something about human sexuality and then you'll enter into the most blissful thing you can imagine. But just trust me, do it my way. And Satan is hissing, saying, did God really say you could never have any sexual pleasure? Well, God never said that. God created human sexuality for uh, pleasure within marriage. But the lie is God wants to rob from you. And it's not true. Satan is a liar. Satan is a very clever liar. And don't believe what he says. Um, Satan's going to say to you men, if you surf porn on the internet, it's not going to hurt your marriage. It's not going to hurt you at all if you surf porn on the internet. And it's a lie. It's an absolute lie. Um, It's not going to hurt you at all if you don't have boundaries within uh, your premarital relationships. It's not going to hurt you at all. It's a lie from the pit of hell. God has good things in mind for us. And reaching out and taking the forbidden fruit, it seemed right to Eve, and it was dead wrong. To fix it, God incarnates forever. Jesus is forever going to be incarnate. He's ever going to be joined to a human body. In fact, in heaven, he's actually going to uh, submit to the Father. As God, he's going to be unsubmitted, but in his incarnation, he's going to submit to the Father. And he's going to do that forever so that he can get one woman, the church, back into the Garden of Eden. He's proven himself that his way is good. He's the Adam who's not uh, deceived. And therefore, he can say that the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man, when he finds it, goes out and sells all that he has and purchases that field. You and I are a little like um, uh, Ronald Wayne. Do you know who Ronald Wayne is? Have you ever heard the name Ronald Wayne? He's the old guy that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak went to for advice about building um, a company. And uh, so the three of them founded Apple. And after 10 days, Ronald Wayne had second thoughts and he said, This might not go so well, so I want you guys to buy out my shares of Apple. 
And so he sold a third of Apple. You know what he sold a third of Apple for? Eight hundred dollars. Do you know what a third of Apple would be worth today? What is it, a hundred billion dollars it would be worth today? If he had kept that stock? You know what Ron Wayne does in life for fun? Plays penny slots in Reno, Nevada. Every day, he's like 85 years old. He wants to cash in. He wants to put a penny in in cash. Do you know how each how much each one of those pennies would be worth if he kept Apple stock? Each penny that he got in that would be worth seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Satan is trying to get us to sell the kingdom of God cheap, and don't do it. Don't do it. I'll see you on. Wednesday.